we're very fortunate uh, today uh, to have um, a leader in, in, dental, in, in dental public health informatics, I'm saying dental public health uh, informatics. Um, Dr. Heiko Spalak serves as the Pro Dean at the University of Sydney Faculty of Dentistry, where his key responsibilities include the, the oh, that wasn't on. You could, I'm sure you could still hear me with it. Not um, but but we're, you know, we're, we're thrilled to have Dr. Spalak with us, who serves as the Pro Dean at the University of Sydney Faculty of Dentistry where his key responsibilities include the consolidation of the dental school's operations and developing the strategic plan for the school in alignment with the direction of the university. He works closely with the dean and faculty leadership to promote cross-faculty and external shared understanding, including negotiations with New South Wales health and local health districts, and to establish joint appointments to share teaching, research, and clinical service. He is actively involved in the reorganization of the faculty that aims to create one faculty of medicine of health, and he chairs the newly established clinical trials advisory group for the university that aims to facilitate and support the startup of clinical trials and proposes risk mitigation strategies for high-risk clinical trials. His research has its focus in the development of educational resources for dental professionals, and the creation of online communities. He published more than 50 peer-reviewed papers and a textbook for dental informatics that has been published in Germany and in the United States. He served as, as the CI of several NIH-supported research projects and is aiming to improve the adoption of evidence-based dentistry. In September of 2016, he received um, a $2.4 million grant from the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research to evaluate the effectiveness of clinical decisions to support improve, and to improve dental provider delivery of brief tobacco interventions. The clinical decision support system will be integrated within two community used electronic dental record systems and will generate personalized evidence-based recommendations for dentists to actively engage their smoking patients in the course of, of usual dental care. Dr. Spalak serves as the representative of the American Association for Dental Research on the American um, Dental Association Standards Committee on Dental Informatics and is current and has recently been elected as vice chairman of the subcommittee on knowledge management. Heiko is counselor of the dental informatics section of the American Dental Education Association. A distinguished scholar and our guest today. Thank you, Dr. Spalak. Please welcome him. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me start in a very modest way and talk about me. Um, I think um, I need to explain my Australian accent. Um, I grew up in Berlin, um, where I also got um, a DMD and PhD. Um, and after working three years as a um, periodontist in a clinic there, um, I moved to the US, where I joined the first department of dental informatics in Philadelphia. And at that time, I uh, wanted to combine dentistry with um, information science and computer science, um, but I didn't have a degree, and I didn't just want to be a hacker, so I thought it would be a good idea to get a degree. So I got a, one of these techno MBAs, um, combining since then in my career dentistry with informatics. In 2002, I moved to a more research-oriented um, institution, the University of Pittsburgh. I think they're currently funded. Um, with $650 million per year in annual federal funding, which puts them at number five in the US. 
eventually I became associate dean there overseeing the IT operation. Um, and in 2015, a new opportunity uh, opened up, and since um, 2016, I'm um, the pro dean, it's essentially the vice dean position at the University of Sydney, as David pointed out, um, mainly responsible for um, leading the school, uh, what you would call as a chief operating officer. But foremost, I'm a dental informatician, and that makes me always a little bit suspicious among practicing dentists and even among dental public health people, especially since my research focuses around the behavior change. So a lot of um, what I'm doing is trying to persuade dental faculty in schools and dental practitioners to change their behavior. And I think it's very dangerous to go out there as a geek and tell them what to do. Uh, it's much more efficient to do behavior change for peers and send someone out who is uh, like these persons, whoever you want to persuade, to do something to change their behavior. So here's my disclosure slide. You can read through this uh, when you download the slide, so I don't want to go over this. So I will talk today about, um, first, why we are keeping records in the first place. Um, and then I want to kind of compare us why we are, how we, how we compare paper records with electronic records and where are really the advantages and disadvantages. Um, I will show how we um, use that data, collect that data, and then what we can do with it. And then I want to focus mostly on how can we convert these data cemeteries into real sources of knowledge. We talked already in the last days a little bit about this pyramid, how we come get from information uh, to really knowledge. Um, I want to connect that to the vision of the learning health system, um, a vision uh, promoted by um, Chuck Friedman at the IOM. And after the showing, showing you the perils of big data, I want to end on an optimistic mo note and um, see what we do in the future. So um, who has not seen this? Um, well, now everybody is shy and doesn't want to raise their hand. So you know it's um, um, Jon Snow's um, famous map of um, the spread of cholera. So what Dr. Snow did, he integrated unstructured data sources and correlated them without having definitive understanding of what were the causations. So I think he would be, could be considered nowadays a big data user. His data were clearly actionable, but he didn't understand it. Um, so do the people, did the people care who he saved from cholera? Probably not. So correlation was all what was necessary here. Um, and I think we need to keep that in mind that sometimes it helps us to understand um, what happens and not not necessarily the why. So let's jump um, 150 years ahead in the pre-electronic dental world. So what do we actually collect? And as you know, we collect quite a bit. I have to say Dr. Snow's um, um, drawing look much neater than what we do or what we did on paper. Um, but um, we are trying to collect as much as possible in dentistry and often more than what uh, our colleagues in dentistry collect. So traditionally we collect a lot of dental um, data in the electronic work world in big databases. And we do this in a much more sophisticated than John Snow did, but I hate to say we don't discover much from that data. Um, we often end up with menial tasks and use the data mostly for billing and accounting purposes or what I call bean counting. So in other words, we create a lot of data cemeteries. So um, if you really want to use the data, we have to use often IT professionals. And um, Mohammed Walji was talking about um, Big Mouth, which is a great project, but we often need IT professionals to actually get something out uh, once you are done with the I2B2 workbench. So the question is really, um, did the introduction of electronic health record help the clinician. And um, a few years ago, um, with the help of some collaborators, we actually looked at this, and uh, we um, did this in paper-based as well as in uh, electronic, um, in practices using electronic health records. And the major themes were here um, that um, there are a lot of unmet information needs by clinicians. Timely access to information uh, about various subjects, 
better visualization of the problems, access to patient-specific evidence information, and accurate, complete, and consistent documentation. So they were all the problems we had uh, with the record system, and it really didn't do much good for the, um, for the, uh, for the um, clinicians uh, to use these electronic health records. So let's enter the brave new world of um, electronic health records because we were promised that once we stop using ink on their trees, the world will be so nice. So why don't we want to use computers in the operatory in the first place? And again, a few years ago, with some collaborators, we looked at why we actually implemented computers. And we called randomly um, 1,159 uh, US dentists, general dentists, and then sampled 256 of them. Um, and that was clearly a time before I was protein, so I actually had time to call my colleagues. And we asked them why did they use computers and why did they implement them. And interestingly here is that most of the information, why they did this or most of the reasons, centered around data management and scheduling is here at the top. Um, so it's not really clinical information. Another interesting snippet is I think that error reduction, a really big topic when it comes to the implementation of electronic medical records in hospital is here at the bottom, only 1%, uh, which can only be interpreted that dentists just never make mistakes. So that's really not important. So the scheduling part is really, um, which um, I had to think back recently, um, because Titanium, the software which now gets implemented uh, for New South Wales, 7.8 million people in Australia, uh, when you go to their website, the first thing you see on a website on a clinic information system is the appointment book. So they must have read this paper, which is such a rare instance if you publish in informatics, uh, that I had to take a screenshot of this because they have really um, understood the message. So scheduling is the most important part when you implement an electronic health record, apparently. So what data do we collect and what happens with the data? And unfortunately, often, they are just collected, but then not used. So this uh, mantra in information sciences, write once, read never. So we wanted to, um, in order to be fair, compare what paper, how paper records compare with electronic records. And I thought it was really an easy exercise because you just look at what should be collected and, you're, and then you see what is collected. But it's not that easy, there's actually no standard for what should be collected. There's no agreement and what actually constitutes an electronic health record in dentistry. So what we did is we um, collected, and I don't want to bore you too much with the methods, but we essentially collected paper records uh, from dental schools, textbooks, as well as from these paper record vendors. And then we looked at how this compares with practice management systems to see if they actually do the same job. Um, and here are the uh, four leading um, practice management systems at the times which we tried to compare. So we came up with this table, um, again, something only possible if you have PhD students uh, who work for you who can come up with this. And I don't want to explain all the details here, but I want to zoom in a little bit and show you a few nuggets of what was really striking, again, comparing the paper part with the electronic part. So we looked at the different categories of information collected. And when you see here D1, that means the first dentist we collect the data from, and DS is dental school, and the vendors are the paper vendors. So what's behind this data? So if you look, for instance, at medication history, you can see here on the right side of the screen that D1, so the dentist one, actually asked, are you taking tranquilizer? And he got a one because he collected that. And then uh, if you look at steroids, this dentist the paper record did not ask for do you use steroids, so he got a zero. So now let's shrink this a little bit together and compare this with the practice management systems. And one of the striking findings was that on we as dentists think it's really important to look for the and ask about the chief concern and the chief complaint here. And the paper records allow you to write it down, but the practice management systems do not have a field for chief complaint. Um, and we found this quite interesting. And then we looked at other things, for instance, consultations when you ask um, um, referrals uh, from physicians, and uh, electronic systems did quite well here, 
but the paper records didn't have much. So the conclusion of that work was essentially that currently um, existing records, um, if you replace existing paper records with electronic systems, they do not reflect exactly what clinicians usually write down and they ki kind of inhibit the tra smooth transition to an electronic system and help the clinicians to record what they really want. So was that transition to electronic health records cheap? And we all know um, HIT is very costly and ultimately we have to ask ourselves, do we get a return on investment? So um, we looked at four dental schools recently and wanted to know how much really is total cost of ownership. And I don't want to read all the numbers to you. Uh, bottom line is it is expensive. And you can follow the link um, uh, to this video which explains it a little bit or um, go, to the, uh, go to the paper. So again, a question of how much do we invest, how much did we get up, do we get out, and how can we translate that data cemetery into a decision-making tool? So what data can we collect? That's, I think, the next important question here. And um, we've heard already a little bit about these things during the conference here. So we have different classes of data. We have structured data. That's what I just talked about, the electronic health records, where we put little fields, or fill out little fields and forms. Then we have a second class of data, these are unstructured data, like voice data nowadays, images, videos. And finally, we have a third class of structures, uh, that's the Internet of Things. Um, and obviously, number two and number three are growing at an exponential rate at the moment uh, through a lot of um, hyper-connected users and patients uploading all their data. Um, here, simplified, uh, symbolized by this Apple Research Kit, um, where um, we really try now, or uh, consumers try now to really collect data from womb to tomb in a personal cloud. But what happens then with this data? And don't have to go through these numbers, but um, you see there's a tremendous growth of these connected devices with all the Fitbits and other uh, tools. You can nowadays buy um, an FDA approved EKG and attach it to your iPhone and measure your heart rhythm, and again, you can upload it to your personal cloud if you, share, if you care to do so. Um, so there are more and more user-generated data. I coined this the Internet of Dental Things. You see here the um, uh, Colibri Dental Toothbrush, and once you brush your teeth, the brushing pattern is then uh, uploaded via your smartphone uh, to a personal cloud. So technology really advances here, given what um, the onboard sensors of these smartphones can do to, uh, uh, can collect and upload to a cloud. Um, but these data are not integrated into the electronic health record. There's no connection there. So they are sitting somewhere, but they don't help the relationship between the clinician and the patient, uh, which is so important because the clinician doesn't know anything about this and doesn't have access to this. So, so we, we really based a lot of data here which we could use and which would give us a really important um, help to improve um, health outcomes and guide um, behavior. So conceptually I'm thinking about the electronic health record and all these devices more like as a, a platform or as a transport mechanism, almost like the electricity flows on an electric grid um, and then later we have to do something with it. So IT cannot be seen in isolation, has to be seen together uh, with the data. And if you really think about standardization, once you standardize, all these systems are infinitely scalable. Um, and, but standardization is a really important part. For most companies nowadays, customization is essentially a death nail if they go their own way. They have to standardize in order to uh, benefit from networking effect so things connect to each other. Think about banking, think about electricity, think about uh, the railroad system. But in health, we are not good at this at the moment. We have a lot of standards, and there are fortunately many you can pick from, um, but we can't always agree about one, and that results in that we can't share our data in a very meaningful and efficient way. So there are more and more of these devices. Here's a um, Chicago startup um, 
the toothbrush, which actually takes pictures of your teeth in between. Um, I think that sounds a little bit too creepy, but anyhow. So what can we learn from these aggregated data? Um, so we've learned already that um, electronic health records are very expensive. Obviously, the government spent other money, $19 billion, on the each incentive um, money, and what did it really buy us? So um, why do we still have all these data cemeteries? And um, did we really consider the quality of the data inserted there? And I think the really important part are consistency, comparability, relevance, timeliness, accuracy, completeness, and trustworthiness. And we heard already a little bit in the previous discussion about the relevance factor here. We tend to collect data we can easily measure. Again, coming back to this bean counting metaphor, uh, collect data of things you can easily measure instead of things which are relevant and make a, make a difference. And then on top of this, obviously, we need very powerful tool to make access easily, easily because the decision makers need to have the tools to access and explore the data themselves through dashboards instead of having to ask an IT professional and then wait three weeks until they finally get an answer. So last week, Atul Gawande published something in the New Yorker, um, and he, some of you might have read this already, and he talked about the potential um, of data, and he said, the potential of this information is so enormous, it's almost scary. And I extracted from this article the four bullet points here um, of the four different kinds of data he talks about, and you can read these on your own, and think about which ones we actually collect when we make healthcare decisions. And I think the answer to this is obviously very little, and, but it would be all useful to see the big picture of the patient and again enhance the clinic, clinician um, patient interface and relationship. So what can be done with big data? I think some of you might have heard this ex classic example where Mayo Clinic, United Health Group, and Optum Labs reproduced a $300 million clinical trial which ran for five years and they did this with the help of their big databases, and they did this in hours. And not surprisingly, they came up with the same results. So think about the opportunity cost here if you would have had these results five years earlier, and if you wouldn't have spent uh, $300 million to, to get to these results. So I was recently involved in a response by the University of Sydney to an inquiry of what in Australia is the Productivity Commission about data availability and data use. And despite the fact that really the healthcare sector was, and I don't think that's an Australian problem, really singled out as the most secretive one and the one use sharing data the least. Um, um, it was also um, promoted here that they wanted to go more towards an open data model where um, in Australia we have about um, 3,200 databases publicly available. In the US, thanks to the uh, Obama initiative, it's now 200,000 data sets. And that's obviously nothing to do with the number of people living uh, there. Um, so it's really important that data can be shared and reused and are well curated, and that was come, came out, I think, in some of the discussions today and yesterday as well. Um, however, data are not a public good, and we need to keep that in mind. They can be uh, the creator or the store of data, can ex exclude others from the data use, we talked a little bit about cost of data access here. Um, so they are not really a public good. Public good are things others cannot be excluded from, and the classic examples are lighthouses or national defense. Uh, but data are clearly not in that category. And it's very expensive to maintain data and have proper stewardship. So when we responded to that uh, government inquiry, um, that was about a lot of different data, soil data and astronomical data, uh, but I was very proud that we sneaked in some data about uh, the interconnectivity and the lack of it between dental and medical data. So an important aspect is following when you design these databases that they need to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the reusable part is very important because that requires a lot of data curation, um, where you need data dictionaries and other things, in order to allow others to use the data so that not only you yourself understand it, but others can make sense out of it 
and we often lack of this because of lack of funding and resources in that arena. So I want to switch gear a little bit and talk about how I see the vision of the dental education warehouse, obviously having worked in dental education my uh, whole professional life. And this is not a new idea in medicine. Um, Mark Triola um, has uh, coined this term, and if you Google his name, uh, you can actually look, um, look up a, a TED talk where he uh, elaborates on this, um, on this vision. So if you think about what we have in education, we have a tremendous amount of, of data in education. Um, you see here the, um, um, the numbers from the US, um, 60 dental schools, 20,000 dental students. And if we want to change how dentists interact with data and how we, how we interact with the patients, obviously dental education is an important part and where we start uh, off with. So we collect a lot of data. Um, but how do we use it in dental education to make decisions and make better dentists? And I think we would miss the boat if we would not think about patient outcomes when we talk about dental education. Because when we look at dental education and assess it by how our students do on national boards, um, then the following question would be, what, who cares? Uh, it's about how these students then later treat the patients. So we could ask questions, for instance, does unprofessional behavior in medical schools predict disciplinary actions by state licensing boards? And I said here on purpose medical because we have actually data about um, medical. It is the case. Um, Papadakis published about us a few papers, um, but we don't have anything in dentistry about that. Um, are DIT and GPA predictors for clinical performance? We don't know. Uh, do virtual case simulations improve the quality of patient history taking by dental students? Again, we don't know. And all these simulation uh, time we spend with these MOOCs and these other um, fancy tools now, um, do they really increase the survival time of restorations and practice? And that's only what counts. It doesn't count uh, the grades uh, the students have at the end. So if we um, look at the bigger picture of the education warehouse, um, we can provide comprehensive, a comprehensive picture of all the learners' detailed information, including the content of the curriculum and assessments. And then by using sophisticated information about a person's performance, strength, weaknesses, interests, and experiences in a clinic, we can model their educational genome and then obviously come up with target learning interventions. So, I don't want to go through all these boxes on this um, vision of a personalized learning uh, uh, approach, but you see in the upper part, it ranges from the admissions data, how students enter, up to continue education when they are practicing dentists, and anything in between, competency exams, simulation data, and so on. But then the important part is, as you see in the lower part of the slide, that is combined with patient outcomes. So when the students are placed in rural service learning or community learning experiences, when they work in our own clinics and treat patients, and then when they enter private practice or corporate dentistry, what are the outcomes um, are, um, later from their treatment? And what patients they see and what procedures they perform, which then should obviously inform what we teach them. Um, because for every procedure we teach these dental students, there's an opportunity cost, and the opportunity cost is not just what it costs to render that treatment, but it's also the time you could have used for other treatments. So should we still teach them how to uh, make full dentures, or should we teach them how to do implants? And these are obviously trade-offs in a limited, um, time-limited uh, curriculum. So how does that all translate into this vision of the um, uh, continu continuous learning improvements for the um, through a learning health network. And um, I want to um, read you one sentence um, um, from this vision of the learning health uh, network. The foundation for learning health care system is a continuous knowledge development, improvement, and application. Although unprecedented levels of information are available, patients and clinicians often lack access to guidance that is relevant, timely, useful, for the circumstances at hand. And I think that's the big problem we have. We do not support clinicians with electronic health records as much as we should do and use data for this. 
So here are a couple of characteristics of the learning health system, and um, they are mostly formed by Chuck Friedman um, at the University of Michigan, um, formerly at the University of Pittsburgh, and he also worked at ONC, similar to um, Doug Fritzmann, who talked yesterday to us. Um, and again, these characteristics, I think, make all sense, and I believe the last one is the really most important part. It's all part of the culture. We need to go away from a system where we ask for an IRB approval, wait six months, and then finally get the approval, um, then change our mind a little bit, wait another six months, until finally we get to the data and can use them and hopefully make decisions uh, from them. So this is what you see here, the, what a learning health system should do, and it's, I think, management 101. You know, you measure something, you get a, a result, you change things, and you measure again, and it's a circle. Um, but unfortunately, what we do in academia and, and a lot of healthcare is this, um, which is really great for um, academics, because the problems never go away. You can always measure them again, write another PhD thesis, and you know the more papers you have, the better you get promoted. Um, but it doesn't help the patient. So we really need to get um, um, to this uh, better system. So um, I think many of you have heard that um, 17 years it takes for translating um, knowledge into, or new knowledge into the practice. So I would suppose that we can see this from a somewhat optimistic view, a little bit tongue in cheek, obviously. Um, because that's faster than what we had previously. So it took 164 years until uh, at least half of the clinicians in the US washed their hands before seeing a patient. And um, so from Ignat Semmelweis, who figured out that it's probably a good idea to wash your hands when you come out of a morgue, um, until half of the clinicians do it, it took 164 years. Now we are down to 17 years. And Lynn Johnson and I, um, at an ADR workshop um, two years ago, uh, postulated that we should actually try to get to 17 months. Um, that's obviously a lofty goal, and I don't know if we will ever reach it, but you have to have a goal to go somewhere. So I think one of the ways to do this is obviously embracing um, ideas and principles of this learning health system so we can translate new knowledge, full data, faster into the practice. So what are the barriers um, to um, big data use? And I think we talked a little bit of, uh, about them. Um, I think most of what was mentioned during the last days centered around the public health sphere and how we analyze and access data. Um, I think I have a few other ones, probably a little bit overlap. So there's this whole data ownership issue. Um, my device, my body, my data. You probably heard about people who had trouble getting to their own uh, pacemaker data um, where device manufacturers said you can't get that data despite as it was measured in their body. Then you want to think about um, data stewardship. Um, you certainly don't want to do what NHS did in the UK where they first promised it's all safe and then they sold the data to insurance companies and then um, patients with um, um, heart conditions got coupons in the mail that they got 20% off of ca caskets. So you really need to be careful uh, with that. It might um, reduce trust. Then we talked a little bit already here about data stewardship, and I think that becomes more and more important. Researchers from Stanford have shown us that de-identified data set can be re-identified with um, machine learning and, and very advanced uh, algorithms. So if you can re-identify data sets, it's not good enough to um, remove the 18 HIPAA identifiers and then publish a data set and think about now I'm good forever. There might be new technologies coming up which allow to re-identify. So continuous data stewardship, I think, is a very important thing. And it's also important for the funders, we have some people from NRDCR here, to think about that that needs to be built in into uh, the funding mechanism because it is expensive. This isn't, come, doesn't come for free. Um, then we need to think about garbage in, garbage out. Um, I think many of you have heard the story of Google flu trends where Google predicted the flu, not really, they only predicted winter. Um, uh, and Umberto was saved, so the CDC didn't have egg in their face anymore, because initially they were, at least to the Nature paper, two weeks behind Google in predicting uh, flu trends. Um, but we had this problem here that we found a correlation, but not causation, and didn't ask deeper questions. And then four years later, it turned out it wasn't really uh, what everybody had expected. 
So to expand on that, I think it's very important that to think about, especially in healthcare, that qualitative data is all behind the house and the wise and the dynamic aspects of healthcare and the human system. And it's very hard to process qualitative data. Obviously, quantitative data are easier to do. And they have a lot of shortcomings. They are just a very shallow shadow of uh, what we find in qualitative data. Think about this when you read in a chart that uh, the toothache was eight out of a scale from one to 10. That doesn't tell you much as a clinician. If you communicate with a patient, you ask much more deeper questions and you can learn much from the quality of the pain in that discussion. But you can't do this very easily from a quantitative um, focus. So we need humans um, who focus on what they should do and what they do best, um, figure out the questions to ask, um, to ask, and then computers do what they do best, go out to 50 databases and pull the data in. So another big problem is obviously big um, data authorism. Um, some of you might have seen them or watched the movie um, Minority Report. In 2007, the Department of Homeland Security launched, launched a research project called FAST, Future Attribute Screening Technology, aiming at identifying potential terrorists by analyzing their individuals' vital signs, body language, and so forth. So I don't know if the new administration will continue with this or stop that, um, but that's the fears of the population. And when we come as health, um, public health experts or data person, that is what it's think about this, even if this is not our intention. So we need to keep this in mind. And then there's um, the fear of artificial intelligence from Stephen Hawkins to Bill Gates. Um, they think it's an existential threat. Artificial intelligence um, will pose, and once we have the general purpose artificial intelligence system, it will take over the world and dismiss us, the humans. I personally think um, as long as Siri cannot understand my accent, we are safe. Um, but um, there is um, obviously a discussion about it, and we shouldn't forget that that discussion might influence funding, um, because obviously it's all politically, so we can't see this in isolation. So I want to conclude with um, some um, future work I'm doing, and if someone is interested, please feel free to contact me about this. So for me, the big question is essentially what would an electronic health record system look like that dentists suddenly can't live without. So think about your teenage kids if you would take their cell phone away. Um, they would be devastated. Um, think about most of us as drivers without a GPS. We probably couldn't exist anymore. Um, but I would pose here that most clinicians would be perfectly fine if, they, if you take the electronic health record system away. They could perfectly practice their um, as long as they have access to the radiographs, I guess, uh, in case they are digital, they would be perfectly fine. So how do we get to that level that the clinicians say, this is part of my treatment um, um, armament and I really need electronic health records? Because then we will get proper data entry, then we will create valid big data, and then we can draw a conclusion of it. I think the big problem is what we, and I think it came a little bit out during the last two days, is that we are afraid that we don't have the right data and not the right quality of data. And data obviously starts with the clinician and the patients, but only if we connect the patient, generate the data, and if we persuade the clinician that this is actually a good thing, they get something out for them, then they will enter proper data. Otherwise, they just do this because we either pay them or we back them or we um, um, call in favors, and that's probably not the best way to create good data. So um, I think I don't have to belabor this. Um, Fankham was talking about this project uh, I'm currently doing with Brad Rinalds and Rinald and many other people from the University of Indianapolis and Pittsburgh, where we look at how the electronic health record can help the dental provider to deliver better um, smoking cessation intervention and increase their efficacy. And it has been shown to approximately double the uh, number of smoking interventions. So they got something out. And interestingly, at the, in the health partner environment, after the study was done, the control clinics who didn't have it were really upset and they wanted to have to think. Um, so that is a, only a small island solution, but it shows me uh, kind of the, the route we should go. And then some of you know I'm involved with a cloud-based electronic health record, uh, which is currently sponsored by the University of Michigan, University of Pittsburgh, and North Carolina, where we partner with Internet2 
and ICE Health System in Canada uh, to develop a cloud-based electronic health record system. And why I'm showing this, that is a system where we bake in research and data collection into the design of the system. And I think that's how it should be. Most electronic health record system in the industry and medicine came out of an accounting approach where we wanted to count something or write bill, bills and invoices and then we glued the clinical part on top of it. I think it should be the other way around. Um, and you still can see nowadays in electronic health record how they were generated and where they came from. So I don't want to fail to um, um, acknowledge my um, collaborators. They have all the good ideas. I just collect them. And I want to leave you with a closing remark from the dying Steve Jobs who said, I think the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. A new era is beginning. And I think that kind of encapsulates what this conference and dental informatics and medical informatics is all about. If someone wants to get in touch with me, it's my contact information. It's also in the um, uh, information of the, uh, from the conference. And the uh, slide shows you why you have so many clouds and we have always blue skies. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thank you very much. The only uh, topics that I did not detect, maybe I was in error, but when it comes to the technologies, I did not see any mention of graph database technology, which is very important for the systematic representation of interrelationships in the data analytics. Mm -hmm. And uh, the example of this, probably internationally, and German, French, and English-speaking countries would be Neo4j. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other thing I didn't uh, detect and uh, mention of was with regard to data analytics again, mm -hmm. and that would be the use of nonlinear or multinomial statistics where there are dynamic processes involved. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. That was the whole question. Thank you. Thanks for sharing all those perspectives, which I know, you know, most of it I know what yeah. your thoughts are. So now that you have gone to Australia, mm. how is the adoption of uh, electronic health records in dental settings mm. and in medicine? Mm. And I know it's too, maybe it's too early for me to ask this, mm. but what are your, what have mm. you le learned in the, mm short time you have been here, yeah. you know, compared to here in the United States and in yeah. Europe. So, it, well, thanks for the question. So, I think it's um, surprisingly very similar to the problems we have in Europe, in the US and in Australia. So, it's kind of almost boring to see that, oh, it's the same problem over and over again. Um, Australia is a little bit different, obviously, from the healthcare delivery system. It has a um, um, universal access to care, um, which means um, everybody um, is eligible to, um, to receive care, which obviously allows easier access to bigger data. Um, in the private dental uh, practices, um, electronic health records are as pervasive as here in the US. So essentially, I think it's close to 100% adoption. Um, in the public system, half of Australia is about uh, on this titanium system. Um, and New South Wales, where Sydney is located in, is adopting it this year. Um, so this will affect 7.8 million people. Uh, but again, there are shortcomings. We um, are mostly do bean counting. Um, it's about production. It's about um, uh, clinical quality indicators, like um, how long after an endo you do an extraction. If it's less than a year, then obviously it's considered a failure, which I would agree with. But is it a measurement of all health quality? And the answer to that is often no. Uh, like everywhere in the world, we have trouble defining oral health care, uh, or quality care, or quality oral health. And then if we don't know what oral health really means, then it's hard to measure it. And then we fall back to measuring, and it's the same in Australia like in the US, we collect procedures. And then we feel very proud if we did more fillings this year than last year. And um, you get a bonus. Um, but that's not really what it's about because we don't know if more fittings means a good or bad thing. And I think that's what all systems struggle everywhere I've been. Um, and it's in Europe, the same system uh, as well as here. And I think that's something where we need to work on and 
I think it comes back to what I tried to express with this, do we ask the right questions in the design of the system? Um, I mean, sure, we want to somehow collect how many fillings you did, and maybe you should get reimbursed by this. But more important, obviously, is did you improve the quality of the oral health of your patients, which, to my knowledge, nobody really measures in a systematic way and on a routine basis. Other questions? Okay. Something else comes up. I, I have a question, up. actually. If you'll, go, go uh, I wanted to visit the 17-month adoption period that you suggested. Mm. Um, and it made me think of kind of what I've seen in the news recently where people are going back to replicate research and finding mm. that the replicability is um, yeah, that the yeah. quality of the research was not really evidence-based. Yeah. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts maybe on the adoption of 17 months, but also the quality of the research and kind of how you think there's an interplay there. Yeah. I mean, there's clear interplay, and it's um, obviously NIDCR and NIH in general has data sharing policies, and it comes back to when you, when you, when you publish your data sets, there's a lot of barriers to that, um, and it's technical barriers, it's data cura curation, but it's also the... Um, uh, the, the problem that there's competition. You would share your data with people who potentially compete with you uh, for grants, and they go through your data, and if you provide them in a very nice and you know, usable way, they might find new things. And that's good for public good, but it's probably not good for you personally, because then they buy the paper and maybe get the next grant. So there is um, a lot of discussion about data sharing, um, even in the research community and provisions about, you know, you have a year until you have to publish your data or release your data and all these things. But why do we put a year hold on data? Um, it's to protect the researcher, but it's, if you think about public good, it's not a good thing to kind of hold back the data. And reproducibility would obviously be um, much more scrutinized if we would publish all data all the time right away. Um, which currently essentially doesn't exist and we don't do in a meaningful way. Um, there are a couple of papers out from Heather Pibova, who's now in um, uh, Vancouver. If you Google impact story, uh, she published quite a bit uh, of things about that, um, how data sharing is essentially either non-existing or very um, immature at the moment. Thank you.